Wow, what a fantastic start to a historic week. This was the opening session of the General Assembly's high-level meeting to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. And as you saw, the Secretary General delivered his report to member states, reiterating the value of multilateral co co cooperation, particularly as the world moves to take swift action to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. And now to lead a discussion on the response of business to this call for greater global cooperation, I'm pleased to hand over to Rajesh Machandani, Chief Communications Officer of the UN Foundation. Over to you, Rajesh. So thank you so much. It's great to see you and great to be with everybody today. Uh, I'm Rajesh Merchandani, the Chief Communication Officer for the United Nations Foundation. And in this session, we're going to be considering what we've just heard and applying it to questions about the priorities, responsibilities, and opportunities for businesses to help global cooperation evolve and to get us back on track towards the SDGs. Because as we all know, we were already off track and the COVID-19 pandemic has shifted us even further, of course. For those of you who do not know much about the UN Foundation, we're an independent nonprofit set up to support the UN and its causes. We're like a best friend, a go-to partner, and we bring together fresh thinking, diverse voices, and we build communities of support to help the UN drive global progress and tackle urgent problems. Now, the idea of business supporting positive social change is nothing new to anyone watching, I imagine. It's why you're all here. What is new is the moment we find ourselves in for a few reasons, not least the pandemic that has shown that humanity is only as strong as our weakest and that our global community depends on each other like never before. This year, we at the Foundation have seen businesses step up in the most remarkable way through the COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund for the World Health Organization that we set up in March and that we still run. Thanks to the generosity and support from more than 150 leading global companies, as well as hundreds of thousands of individuals around the world, the fund has raised more than $230 million for the global response against the pandemic. It's in fact the largest single contributor to the World Health Organization's response work. So if there's ever an example of businesses helping to deliver real social impact and supporting the UN and governments, that is it. But this is also a unique moment for a couple of other reasons. It's a unique moment of reckoning, if you like, for businesses by consumers, because they increasingly expect businesses to take a stand and to contribute to social change. And it's also the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, formed out of the ashes of the Second World War, when nations chose cooperation over conflict. Again, COVID-19 shows that we need that global cooperation more than ever. Yet, as the Secretary General pointed out in his opening remarks, it seems harder to achieve than ever. He said, we have a deficit of solutions and we need a recommitment to multilateralism. We have a surplus of multilateral challenges, he said, and a deficit of solutions. In the opening ceremony of the UN 75 commemoration that we've just been watching, we heard the Secretary General lay out some of those key challenges that we now face as a world, climate, biodiversity, inequalities, hatred. And we've also been giving some of our attention to the findings of the global consultation that the UN has been carrying out all year. One million people in every country have responded to questions about the uh, current and future concerns and how the UN can help address those. Today, our eminent panel is going to consider what we've heard from the UN 75 report and apply it to questions of priorities and actions, as I said, that businesses can and should take to help global cooperation evolve and to get us back on track towards the SDGs. So without further ado, let's meet our speakers today. Let me introduce you, first of all, to Sharon Thorne, who's the global chair of the board of Lloyd. She brings more than 30 years of experience auditing and advising clients across a broad range of sectors. She's an advocate for collective action on environmental sustainability. 
and a champion for higher representation of women in global leadership. And I see Paul Polman has just joined us as well. Welcome, Paul. He's the co-founder and chair of Imagine, which mobilizes business leaders around tackling climate change and global inequality. He's vice chair of the board of the UN Global Compact and the former CEO of Unilever. And in that role, he was a leading proponent of business being a force for good, demonstrating how a long-term multi-stakeholder model goes hand in hand with excellent financial performance. He was, of course, also part of the group of global leaders that helped develop the SDGs. Ibukun Oluwa Abiodun Awosika is the chairwoman of the First Bank of Nigeria and serves on a number of corporate and non-profit boards in Nigeria. She's a champion for social and women's issues and a founder of Women in Business, Management and Public Service. She's also an ordained pastor and works with several faith groups. Our fourth panelist this morning is Ignacio Galan, chairman and CEO of Ibadrola, a multinational renewable energy company. Under his leadership, the company has expanded around the world and now supplies clean energy to 100 million people, mainly in Latin America, Australia and Europe. It's one of the largest in the sector, in fact. Today, nearly 80% of Ibadrola's installed capacity is emissions free and it's also one of the world's largest wind energy producers. Panel, I'm delighted to have you with us. Thank you so much for giving us your time and attention and your expertise this morning. Uh, this is designed to be a free-flowing conversation. Uh, despite the kind of constraints of virtual technology, uh, we do want you not to feel hesitant to jump in. I will have a few questions to guide the discussion. Uh, but as I said, feel free to jump in at any time. To those watching, Please do use social media to join in the conversation. Use hashtags Uniting Business Live and Uniting Business. And feel free to follow me as well on Twitter. I'm at Rajesh Merchant. Firstly, let's turn to something that we've been reading about and learning about, which is the, the key takeaways from the UN 75 consultations. I'll just run through some of those key points very quickly because they will help frame our conversation. The key findings were that um, most respondents said their immediate priority everywhere is better access to basic services, healthcare, safe water, sanitation, education. The next priority is greater international solidarity and increased support for, uh, to places hardest hit by the pandemic. Younger respondents and people in developing economies say they feel more optimistic about the future than older people in developed economies. Many felt that access to health, education, and women's rights will improve. The biggest medium concern, medium to long-term concern, I should say, for all respondents is climate change. Also in that list of medium to long-term concerns are human rights, settling conflicts, tackling poverty and reducing corruption. And then moving to thinking about the role of the UN, 87% of respondents think greater global cooperation is essential in future. 60% think the UN has made the world a place, and 74%, almost three quarters, think it will be essential in the future. So as you can see, these results really open up a lot of areas of questions for business community, not just questions, but also responsibilities and opportunities uh, as well. And as the Secretary General said in his remarks just now, no one wants a world government, but we must, must work together to improve world governance. And he talked about something called networked multilateralism or inclusive multilateralism. That's one of the things that we may consider on our panel day. So panel, let's kick off. Let me first get some quick reactions to you, from you, um, about what you've been reading about the UN 75 report findings, some of the summary that points that I just went through, some of the key concerns for citizens uh, around the world. And Paul Pullman, Paul Pullman, let me start with you. Thanks for the opportunity and uh, to be on such an illustrious panel and the topic could not be more important. The positive side on this report is what you've mentioned already, 74% see the UN as, uh, as essential, 87% uh, want better cooperation. Uh, today, as well, the UN Global Compact, 12,000 members handed over signatures from nearly 1,300 companies, major companies, calling for this multilateralism and stepping up. That's obviously the biggest challenge that we have right now. And I'm also pleased to see that the young are more optimistic. It is not surprising that the 
report talks about immediate opportunities that need to be addressed, like health, life and livelihood, as we say, and ensure that the basic necessities are met. But it's also important to notice that everybody understands that as we get out of the immediate threats of the COVID crisis, and we're not there yet, but that we also build back something differently than what we had before. It's very clear that before COVID, the world wasn't functioning either. Gender equality would have taken 257 years. We were on a 3% plus trajectory on climate change. Inequality was going up. So it is absolutely an imperative that as the governments of this world put their strengthening plans in place, they put it behind a green recovery, which happens to be a recovery that generates more jobs, more resilient jobs, better jobs, and obviously a future that is also more sustainable for now and, and generations to come. The reality, unfortunately, is that if we look at the actual actions right now by the government, it doesn't mirror what is actually needed. To date, the funds that have been committed are still heavily skewed towards the fossil fuel industry, uh, twice the level as the funds behind a green recovery. And then, uh, secondly, um, most of the governments uh, are making commitments in words, but often not matched in action. And this is where the problem is. For the first time, as the Secretary General pointed out, we're seeing a private sector that is asking for bolder and more ambitious commitments than we see governments able to deliver. Well, thanks so much. Um, Sharon, um, with some of those points in mind and some of the UN75 findings, uh, what are your takeaways from the, what citizens around the world are saying about their concerns now and in the future? Oh, thank you. I'm absolutely delighted to be here on this panel as well. And firstly, congratulations to the UN on 75 years. It's an incredible milestone. And the UN has played such an important role to date in global cooperation. However, we are facing existential threats, enormous uncertainty, and we need governments. I absolutely echo what Paul said. You know, we need governments, governments to step up and business to help us navigate the healthcare, economic and climate crisis. And we really need the UN as a convener and catalyst for change to push them harder. So what is, you know, what is the role of the UN to really drive that? And I think the report you know, has come up with some excellent um, recommendations and thoughts for us and you know, really highlights the areas that have to be focused on if we're going to deliver the SDGs, uh, international solidarity, focus on climate change, addressing inequalities which have been really exacerbated by COVID, the importance of youth and improving access to basic services. And in January of this year at Davos, I chaired a panel where we were exploring the need for really urgent and collective action to advance the progress towards the SDGs. And we talked about the fact the world is running out of time. And eight months later, with the impact of COVID exacerbating those inequalities, you know, it's more critical than ever that we work together across governments, business and civil society. And my hope from the conversation today and conversations this week is that we, that's all of us, commit to rapid, tangible, collective action on the SDGs with the same speed as we're seeing people respond to the virus. So you can see urgent action is possible, but we really need to focus on the SDGs. Okay, Sharon Thorne, thank you very much. My goodness, Davos seems such a long time ago now. There's such a world ago, doesn't it, back in January? A uh, whole different, the world has changed so much. Um, uh, Ibukun Awasika uh, the, from Nigeria. If we don't get the SDGs happen in Nigeria, we can't make them happen anywhere. Um, given the size of Nigeria's population, its economy, its, its, its crucial position in driving change for the continent of Africa, but also as being a bellwether for global progress uh, as well. So how do you respond then to the, the, the opinions and views aired by citizens around the world that you've read about in the UN75 report findings? And how do you think that uh, business can play a bigger role Okay, thank you very much and uh, congratulations to the uh, UN on its uh, 75th anniversary. 
And um, the conversation we're having, it's important in the context of the time and the moment that we're in, because we're also all able to see, I think the, um, what COVID has done in this time and season is that it has exposed um, the assumptions that we've made in terms of where we are uh, as, a, as a continent right now and the effectiveness of all the actions of our uh, uh, multilateral agencies, businesses, and uh, all the groups and the things that we do need to pay attention to. It's um, made it even more important in terms of uh, achieving uh, the targets where the SDGs are concerned and uh, the people. And if I, if we bring it back home to a continent like ours and to maybe a country like ours as well, you realize that uh, it's not enough um, just to talk about these things. It's become even more important uh, for us to act. And uh, in the collective interest of all of our nations and the world as a whole, we all need to respond uh, with a sense of inclusiveness, realizing as COVID has exposed that um, a weakness on one, at one end of the world becomes a weakness for the entire world, as we can see, because the problems travel uh, far and wide to catch up with us, no matter what's ha happening. So we're only as strong as our weakest link. And businesses in particular, uh, as we multi-trade across different platforms and different terrains, we realize that the exposures that we have in one part of the world that isn't taken care of by doing the right things at the right time and in the interest uh, of a full uh, um, globe will ultimately come to roost um, uh, at the back end of our, our main homes or our primary markets and all of that. So at the end of it, it's really important, um, the conversation between uh, um, the UN and all of the agencies that are involved and the businesses and uh, um, activists and all the different groups that can work together for us to look at achieving the kind of solution that we need for the world to work for all of us. Okay, thanks for that. We'll return, we'll return to this question of um, the, the conversation that businesses can help drive with the UN and at the UN in a second. Thanks for putting that on our agenda out there. Uh, Ignacio Galan, um, climate change appeared as one of the concerns of people. Um, your company is you know, leading in trying to change the status quo. Uh, as Paul Pullman said, reminded us, there's still many more funds committed to investing in fossil fuels and in renewable, renewable energy. But your company is trying to change that, which is you know, leading the way uh, on that. Um, with that in mind, then, let me get your first responses to uh, the UN 75 findings. And then I'm going to pick up on this question of climate change with you, and we'll open it out to everybody else. But first of all, let's get your, your thoughts on the, on the findings and the views of citizens around the world. Well, first of all, congratulations from the 75 anniversary of United Nations. Felicidades. Uh, I think, it's, uh, uh, as Paul said, it's time for action. A goal is not enough. Uh, we companies, uh, we have to measure and report about results. I think that is a moral obligation. And uh, I think it's... Uh, uh, I would like to say that this initiative of 75%, United Nations 75, is, uh, is very good and show that United Nations want to hear people's needs. This report concludes that there is still a long way to go to invest in basic infrastructures as energy. People are urging us to provide a cleaner, resilient, affordable energy service, especially now after a COVID crisis. I think we've been already delivering and, su and supplying electricity, even with uh, almost everybody was confined. I think people was able to communicate, was able to make videos, was able to even work, uh, telework, things, then the lives were on. And, uh, and I think that is what the police request in this moment. As well, most uh, respondents of this across the whole region are extremely worried about climate change. And I think we need to do more. And we have technology, funds, knowledge uh, to reach already climate neutrality to 2050. This morning I was really attending just uh, 
a call with the Vice President of the European Commission, Timmerman, and I was already congratulating because of the decision taken by the European Union to reach already, uh, uh, diminish the, the emission by 55% by 2030. Uh, uh, but uh, beyond this, uh, people are asking as well companies to be more and more social. Uh, consumers choose companies that reflect their own values. Business, we, we need to be part of the communities. Uh, we never, Jola, many years ago, we formalized this commitment in our bylaws creating what we call social dividend, which obliges us as much as a financial dividend. I can tell you that in my annual uh, shareholders meeting, I spent much more time reporting on our contribution to each of the sustainable development goals than our financial results. Because financial results, actually, I'm already just presented to the investors. In a day-to-day -day basis, our investor relations team is already in contact with investors, in contact with analysts. But I think we are not ready such with the society as a whole. That's why I dedicate more time for that other one. What means social dividend uh, for us? So social dividend for us means uh, job creation. Job creation, thanks of the investment we are making. I, in this moment, this year, because of this situation, we are doubling our annual investment for more than $12 billion this year, which I think is more than twice what we've been making in the last uh, a few years. And that is already generating jobs, but that is generating because we are, emitting, we are investing in renewables, in networks, in, in, in storage. That means less emission and pollution. We have already closed all our coal power plant, all our coal power plant, and our, even our, our emission is less than one third of the, our peers worldwide. I think we continue in this direction. We put as well a special accent uh, in education. Not only to our people who you are dedicating almost 57 hours per employee, but as well in the region where presence, for instance, we have already rebuilding schools destroyed by earthquakes in Oaxaca, in Mexico, or in inclusion. Uh, I think we are uh, in some countries, is uh, our sector traditionally is more uh, 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 men driven. So we are making a special skilling program for female electricians in Brazil. I think those are the core of our, of our activity. So to conclude, I always explain the role of our business showing a triangle formed by employees, shareholders, and society. And we must, as managers of business leaders, to generate wealth for all of them in a balanced way. If not, we are not doing properly our job. Okay, thank you, uh, Ignacio Gunn. Let me stay with you, uh, uh, Mr. Galan. I, I want to pick up on a point that came out of the UN 75 report. Um, it found that for citizens all over the world, uh, a medium to long term, the most pressing medium to long term concern was climate change. How, what do you make of the fact that people aren't saying that that is their most pressing concern now? And how? Can this community help shift that? Because we're seeing the impacts of that right now. Let me get the first response for you, and then let me invite others to also respond to that question as well. So I'm going to make a very concrete example of how the private sector can make a difference working together with the United Nations. Iberdrola, uh, the company I chair since the last 20 years, we are 120 years old company. And we've been already for almost 100 years a traditional utility. When I joined the company 20 years ago, not many companies considered climate change, change as a real uh, issue. But we feel that uh, something has to be done in this respect. And we started our own energy transition. And I, that was just after Kyoto Protocol was signed. We launched a very powerful signal to politicians, civil society, companies, and we need to change. And I can tell you that I was already suffered a lot of pressure for all parties. Colleagues, politicians, regulators, even financial institutions. It was already a tremendous, a lot of opposition. Nobody believed that uh, that, that can already be a good business opportunity. So uh, uh, almost uh, 15, 20 years later, 
most of those actors has been fighting against ourselves are taking a more and more active role, which I'm very pleased. I think it's a it's very important step when there was the Paris Agreement was signed. I think that in this, uh, the private sector and the civil society took uh, real leadership, so showing the, the, to the politicians a way to follow. I, I'm quite sure, at least that was my perception for the countries I had already present at that time, that without this pressure, the ambition would not have been the same that we have today. As I said, we started the transformation in 20, uh, 2001. We designed a new strategic plan, and we started from values. I think in our chart, I think uh, we put uh, uh, values uh, as a main uh, driver of all these things. Numbers were very important, figures were very important, but purpose is more important. I think we propose we mobilize people. With numbers, we are not mobilizing the people as much as we mobilize. We have already invested $130 billion in renewable energies, networks, and storage. And as I mentioned before, if we close all our coal and oil plants. We reskill our workforce and support jobs in this moment for almost 400,000 people in our supply chains. And we have to reconvert traditional sectors into the economy of the future, in particular in the press areas. I, I, I'm very proud to say that uh, I was already part of the Spanish a recovery plan in the north of the country when it was much younger. And I think certain companies were already in trouble, like uh, steel industries, aeronautics at that time, et cetera. We compete in, in producer of wind turbines, or seed yards, which were already without work for many years, now are our suppliers of our offshore wind platforms. Uh, we, so we managed to generate wealth for our shareholders, if I agree at the same time. So uh, we are doing so for the society. And the result is that the, our uh, uh, market cap is six times more than it was. And uh, we are becoming one of the three largest utilities worldwide for market cap in this moment. The total return to our shareholders has been 700% in the period, 100% in the period. Uh, so I think industrial transformation like uh, we had already uh, late in the Brajola, are more than necessary than ever in the coming year to reveal our economies. So I, I, I've been repeating for many, many years, climatic change is not a threat, it's an opportunity. And I think United Nations has a unique capacity to launch movement like this, to bring people together and address global problems. So let me just tell you, that's a great point. Uh, if you don't mind, just let me just jump in. Um, that's a great point you made. And, you know, one of the reasons we celebrate your company here is because of the example that you're setting. Um, uh, but Paul Pullman, I saw you nodding uh, a little bit earlier when I was making the point that citizens in the UN75 report express that climate change is a medium to long-term concern. You know, Ignacio Galan has pointed out that it's an opportunity now. How do business help make citizens understand the, the risk that we face now and pivot to that opportunity because you know we hear a lot about the doom and gloom forecast of climate change but there is a positive narrative that perhaps you know we need to do more to build out and and disseminate around the world yeah so it's actually no surprise what you see in the study this COVID has unlike climate change has immediately stopped all of our economies uh, 90 percent of the kids could not go to school Again, we have seen that it affects disproportionately the poor. It now has a, reach, a, reach, a, reach, a racial dimension to it. And, um, you know, it has affected all industries, unlike the financial crisis or unlike climate change. This has been one of the biggest and fastest shocks to, uh, to the global economy that we've ever seen. And it is not surprising that citizens of this world, first and foremost, are calling for immediate basic services like healthcare or sanitation or clean water, or that people are asking for equal rights that, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter or uh, the discrimination that we still see on gender across the world, all that has become transparent. And that's a major concern. You know, this is still a world that uh, COVID has shown once more that 60% of the people are in marginal jobs. 
that five billion people don't have access really to legal systems, that that the poor pay disproportionately for everything. They pay for climate change, for exclusion of education, for uh, COVID. And, and that what is the first need that they all have, with the biggest concern being jobs. <laughs> We're seeing an enormous job change and job destruction. And again, it disproportionately falls on the poor. And I think that's what this survey, survey says. But what it also says is, and that is an important thing, coming out of COVID, I think there's a heightened awareness that you cannot have healthy people on an unhealthy planet. There's also a heightened awareness that we don't want to go back to where we came from. Over 95% of the citizens say that and want to go back to something that is better. And we've also seen how quickly we can take action. Like we've taken action on health, and it's still going on, we can take now that same speed of action on climate change. So these are all positive things. And finally, I think where the <coughs> business community and the financial community is coming in now is, is that people are now clearly understanding that the costs that we are incurring to deal with these catastrophes which will happen in increasing frequency, also around climate change, is now significantly higher than what it would cost us to avoid these issues in the first place, which on the positive side makes it a very attractive investment, also for the financial and the business community. And that's why I think you'll actually see an acceleration with announcements. Today it was um, Walmart, Yesterday it was BP, the day before it was Microsoft, increasingly not only climate, but also nature. And some of the major initiatives that the UN Global Compact is leading behind the race to zero or the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance or some of the other initiatives that we're leading on climate change are really gaining traction. Where is the challenge? I don't believe anymore in direction or in the, the need for it, but the challenge is to now implement it at scale and speed that we need. And for that, ultimately, we need measurements, we need more active involvement of the financial market, and yes, we sure. need the governments to be held accountable to the commitments that they make, at least in worth, but then often don't match in action. And as well as all those stakeholders, uh, I would argue, um, you probably need boards as well. So let's get a, a, a sure, yeah. question to Sharon Horn and to Ibukun Awasika. Um, you both bring huge experience of serving on a number of boards. Uh, how, to what extent are you seeing a shift in the understanding at the board level or the investor level that they need to move companies from uh, a shareholder perspective to a stakeholder perspective. And with that in mind also, you know, you both have talked about uh, driving the conversation through, with governments and other stakeholders through the UN and the UN being a convener and a catalyst. So when the Secretary General talks about inclusive or networked multilateralism, he includes the role of businesses in that. How do businesses do more than show up at the table how do you help shape and drive that conversation? Because it's not been a traditional role of business to drive the conversation uh, on so change. It's been one of businesses to catch up. But now you have an opportunity, and this group certainly seems to understand that you have the uh, potential and responsibility to drive that conversation. So how do you do that? Okay, shall I kick off? Thanks. Yes. Yeah. So... You know, just thinking about the role of boards, um, I guess it, it 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 has a critical. You know, we have a critical role to play because we should be, you know, ensuring that our organisations are focused on the right thing. You reference stakeholder capitalism; it is something that we've taken very seriously for a long time. Uh, we talk very much about our purpose to make an impact that matters for our clients, uh, our people, and the societies that we work and live in. And so that drives, you know, our behaviours and drives our business decisions. And that's something that the board is responsible for ensuring, you know, that we're doing that, driving that throughout the organisation. Obviously, it's the responsibility of the executive to deliver on that. And there are expectations, not just from, um, you know, regulators around these things, but also from our people 
uh, and from other stakeholders, you know, our, our customers and so on. So it is it is critical. Now you talked about multilateralism and you know the ro our role in that, and I do think we have a big role to play. Um, and it's that inclusive multilateralism where you know it, it is all businesses, civil society, and governments. And um, we saw the power of collective action when the 2030 agenda was established, set an ambitious roadmap. But it feels like we are not achieving what well, we know we're not achieving, what we need to. There's a lot of evidence that says that the SDGs will not be achieved for many, many years. The Social Progress Index came out recently and said it would be 2082 at the current pace of change that we will achieve the SDGs. So we really have to accelerate action. We're very proud at Deloitte to have signed to the, uh, the UN Global Compact Statement for renewed global cooperation. But one, you know, I suppose, tangible example of the role that businesses can play is engaging in something that we call pre-competitive collaboration. And, you know, by businesses working together, rather than just focusing on their own needs, their own profitability, you know, trying to work together to overcome obstacles or solve complex challenges and create you know, really actionable solutions. And there have been some great examples of this activity coming out of the, the pandemic with, you know, pharma companies in particular and PPE producers, medical suppliers, vaccine developers. But there's also been quite a lot of collaboration and activity in the sustainability field. So, for example, food producers working together to establish sustainable and ethical supply chains. So it's trying to work out, you know, how we drive even more of that pre-competitive collaboration across businesses to help make a difference. And it's something, again, that boards can, can help drive through their, their businesses. Okay. Um, if I may, yes. The reality is um, in, in the oversight role of boards and in setting uh, strategic directions uh, for organizations, uh, you will find that boards can highly influence um, the actions that take place even within a country outside of their specific boardroom. Because you would find in environments where the government in itself is not acting as quickly or responsibly in terms of some of these issues that we're talking about. If um, private companies, with the board leading and setting the agenda, have a sense of consciousness and commitment to these issues, and therefore, and I'm talking about part of what uh, Sharon talked about in terms of collaboration, and um, they're able to take issues that seem low on the agenda and raise it to a high level on the agenda nationally. In, in a country where the government in itself is not sensitive to it. In most cases, they're looking for help. And where through the work of the boards, our corporate organizations drive those issues collaboratively, you will find that you're then able to get the attention of the government to rise to the challenge of working with the um, agenda set by the company in order for that to come to play. If I, if I just give an example of like, let's talk about like this COVID situation in our country. You know, one of the biggest fear of most uh, countries of the world was what would happen as COVID uh, manifested across Africa. And um, so I, to everybody's surprise, it hasn't worked out that way. We've actually had uh, a far more uh, successful uh, response to the situation as to what could have happened considering our healthcare system, the weaknesses of uh, a lot of issues. And even we, in many cases, were not sure of the ability of our governments to respond. But if I use Nigeria as an example, the, the drivers of the response to it was the corporate organizations, especially the financial services industry came together and set up an action, put funds together, then worked with government and his own structure to drive a response for the country to be able to effectively take control of the process uh, to contain and to control uh, the COVID impact on our country. And that's been extremely successful, contrary to what would have happened. So it just gives an example of what we can do on any kind of issues, driving it 
from the boardroom. When we take on an issue, the power of corporate organizations collectively can drive the direction of uh, government's reaction to an issue. And we, if we use those things when we're trying to lobby or mobilize for actions that support our business. But we have to look at all of these issues from climate change to healthcare factors and all of these other factors as factors that ultimately affect our business. Because one way or the other, depending on um, how diverse your business base is across the globe, you would find that what's going on in one part of the world or the other is going to come into your boardroom in terms of your numbers. And driving all of these issues from global change to gender issues to all of the SDG issues that we're talking about, driving them with as a conscious part of our board responsibility and business activity in a, as a function of enlightened self-interest for the company will ultimately help us to achieve higher results and faster because businesses generally are much faster than governments tend to react to situation. And I think we have that power that we can use. Great point. Let me throw it open to others yeah. to respond. No, I just wanted to make a quick comment because it is undoubtedly clear what was just said by uh, the two previous speakers that the importance of the boards should not be underestimated. But the reality today is that only about 3% of the boards are climate competent. The racial or gender diversity of the boards aren't there. The rapid change that you now see to digital or different roles that governments are going to play and multilateralism and that that requires different levels of partnership. It simply isn't there at scale at the board level. Just like we need to get new leaders in that run these companies with a higher sense of purpose and a different form of a multi-stakeholder partnership, so do we need to look critically at boards. Many of the CEOs are playing back that the pressures of short-termism and, and um, stakeholder primacy are as much coming from the boards as it does from financial markets. And as I said, with climate change being our most urgent challenge, and frankly, only 3% of the board members really competent to have discussions about climate change, we have our jobs cut out. So it's important to celebrate the good companies. Many of them are members of the UN Global Compact, and we're obviously driving programs to educate but you know the business community is large and we have still an enormous job to do and it can only happen not only if these businesses go together and form these partnerships to indeed move to this pre-competitive space i always say we don't compete on the future of humanity but we also need the governments with more urgency to put the right frameworks laws rules and regulations in place sorry if i may just jump in Oh, I'm sorry, Sharon. I was just going to say, you know, one of the um, things to take out of what Paul just said the most is, and, and I say this with all due respect, that as you get more women into the boardroom, the sensitivity of women to issues like that, you cannot dispute. And it does make Absolutely. a lot of difference because you will find the, the companies that are most sensitive to all of these issues that we're talking about are companies that are led by women. I, I think it's just a oh. function of our communal a higher communal sense and sense of responsibility to all of these issues. And when the boards have high diversity, you would find that they're boards that will commit more. And then we need to engage companies who are already active in these spaces to actively recruit companies into this space. So UN in itself needs to have more events around the business group. A lot of engagement is done with governments, but you will find out that there's a lot faster results that can be achieved as you get a lot of corporates who can themselves push governments. And you need to educate a lot more business leaders effectively and recruit them. As, as you, you had someone like Paul working on this, even when you were CEO of Unilever and has continued even in retirement to actively do this. That's because he became a disciple of this agenda and takes this seriously. And getting more business people to understand the rest, their responsibility and the importance of this issue would be key to being able to achieve this. Yeah, totally. Okay, can I, can I just, Sharon Thorne and then Ignacio yeah, Galan. Thank you. No, I, I know it's a great point that you make, um, 
Ibo can clear, that um, more women in the boardroom does have an impact. But actually, one of the key things we've been doing at Deloitte is to help educate our clients. And we became a member of Chapter Zero and, and supported Chapter Zero in the UK, which also looks to educate non-executive directors about the impacts of climate. We've been doing a lot through the Deloitte Academy in the UK. We have similar academies around the world to help educate non-executive directors and directors because I'm feel very strongly that, to Paul's point, we need directors who are climate fluent, as we refer to it. But you were also doing a lot to educate our people, because one of the things we talked about earlier was, you know, the, the climate is a bit of, you know, a longer term on people's agenda. If we educate people, and all of the people that work for us, we have over 300,000 people. As part of our climate commitment, we're taking them on, on, on a journey, educating them, and encouraging them to make responsible choices and I suppose explaining what those are and then trying to introduce a degree of competitiveness and gamification, encouraging them to go back to their families, et cetera, et cetera. So there's just, there's a big education. If we do not address climate really quickly, to Paul's earlier point, we won't have a healthy planet for us to exist on. No, oh, very true. So may I know? So uh, I think it's... Uh, Perhaps uh, we are, uh, we've been so successful in transforming our company because we are the company, probably the utility worldwide, or more women in our board. So, which I think I already agree with what you are already saying in this respect. But as well, another point very important is that boards need to be educated. You, Sharon, mentioned something like that. I think the business leaders, we, the CEOs of the companies, we have a responsibility to educate our boards. Our boards are not experts in all things. They are, they, they are already conducting the company, what is the, 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 the point we would like to go, but I think we are the experts. That one. We have to convince ourselves on that one. And I think something that Paul was already mentioning, I 100% agree. I think the time of the greenwashing is over. We've been seeing for uh, the last uh, few years, uh, first the deniers and afterward the deleters we're trying to postpone to take any action. And those one are influencing as well in our boards. But I think as much as we are moving in that direction of measuring more and uh, using less nice words and moving to the action, and that is the action is the responsibility of the CEOs of the companies. We CEOs, we have already the obligation to conduct the company in one direction or another one. So, I think I agree with uh, women. We have an important role on that one. I said I'm proud to say that uh, probably my my uh, women's in my board has already forced to me to move in this direction. But as well, we have to educate the boards to move in some direction or the other one using uh, data that we have already available. They have not, and already sometimes taking hard decisions. When I decide to invest uh, 20 billion in closing our coal power plant and closing our oil power plant, some members of my board were very, very upset on that one. And I put my job on the table and said, oh, we go here or leave. And we need to make this, this sort of thing. So I think it's, I, I think sometimes we cannot already leave at this goal. We have already to conduct the people in the right direction. But I think Paul, 100% agree with you that we have to measure more less words and more action. So it's time for action, it's not time for words. Yeah. Okay, sure. panel, this is a fantastic conversation. We only have three minutes left, but I'm gonna try something. I'm gonna give you 30 seconds each, and I want you to give me one thing. I've heard already, boards need to be more diverse, boards need to be educated on issues, start with gender diversity, but also make sure uh, board understand climate and are more clip fluent. These are great priorities. I want from each of you one priority for people watching, uh, members of the UN Global Compact. What is the one thing that you would like to suggest that they start with in order to help get us back on track to deliver the SDGs by 2030? I'm going to keep you all to 30 seconds each. Let's start with Paul Polman. Oh, I'm taking a slightly different tack, which is that the UN can play an enormously important role to be the voice of the marginalized. And uh, the opportunities to create this more inclusive uh, world that we live in is increasingly understood 
by the business community. There is no business case in enduring poverty, nor can the business community be a bystander in a system that gives them life in the first place. And I think the duty of the UN is, is to continue to drive that inclusive agenda. We cannot create a functioning world if we don't fight for equity, inclusion, dignity and respect for everybody. So I'd actually like to end on that note more than anything else. And I think the UN and the Secretary General continue to do a marvelous job to keep that high on the, uh, in front of us, uh, the private sector. Okay, thank you. Uh, Shem Thorne, 30 seconds. Um, so I want to build on my comment about making responsible choices and as individuals we can all do more. I think addressing climate change is not a choice, it's billions of choices. And I talked about what we're doing with our people and empowering 330,000 people to make responsible choices. But then you need to apply that more into businesses and governments and NGOs to get them to take action. And a great example of an, is Street Football World and they use football as a catalyst to tackle social change. So can we leverage things like that more? They want to mobilize the power of 4 billion football fans across the world to take action for the SDGs through their Give 90 campaign. Okay, Ignacio Galan, 30 seconds. So, uh, I only know a way to work on a crisis is to invest more uh, uh, and better, uh, to work more. Uh, and to be more productive, more efficient. The second thing is that we need to run. We need to accelerate, accelerate, accelerate. As businesses, we need to transform this recovery plan in concrete projects. And I come again to the point and Paul, less words, more action. And that is what we have been doing in Everdola for 20 years. And the last one is to need to put the sustainable development goals in the center of our business plan to report in our General Assembly what we are doing on that one, so that we report our, our dividend or our economic results, what we're doing in terms of the sustainable development goals for everybody. Okay, Ibukun Awasika, 30 seconds. Okay, well, I only have 14 left. Well, I'm only going to say this one. Black lives matter, black lives matter and black lives really matter. And when you look across the entire world, that population of blacks needs to be a major issue for the UN as a case study in itself. And real actions that will cause that mind shift and create, close, remove that inequity that exists based on the color of skin needs to be dealt with as a global issue because it cuts across different continents. And it's a problem we cannot move to the next generation. It's too painful and it's breaking hearts. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like we could talk for another hour, panelists. Um, but this is the first event for this year's uh, Private Sector Forum on Uniting Business Live. Thank you so much for the wisdom and the expertise and the insights that you've brought. I'm sure that will set the agenda and set the people thinking who are watching uh, all over the world. Uh, so, panelists. Thank you very much indeed for your time this morning and thanks to the UN Global Compact. And that, Tolu, I will hand it back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rajas, and distinguished panelists for a great conversation. Thank you to our Uniting Business Live audience for joining us from around the world for today's Private Sector Forum. We are now going to take a break from our plenary session and invite you to explore our expo area where you can learn more about the UN Global Compacts programs, including Target Gender Equality and the UN Global Compact Academy. These programs are designed to provide companies with the knowledge, skill, and motivation that they need to meet their sustainability objectives and help achieve the SDGs. Also in the Expo area, our sponsor companies are highlighting their own sustainability journeys. You can learn more about how they are integrating the 10 principles and SDGs into their businesses by watching their sessions and films.
Last but not least, I'd like to encourage all of you to take some time to use the networking tool and have one-on-one -on -one video chats with your fellow attendees. It's the next best thing to meeting people in the lineup for coffee, but without the carbon footprint. I would like, I would, I will be back here in 30 minutes to introduce our next session on human rights and development. Thank you.